Amen. Thank you, Perry. And good morning. Warm enough? Too warm? Zero degrees down here this morning in the vicinity of, the, of our building here. But it's nice and toasty inside, maybe too warm. Um, but what a thank you for that, that uh, Lord's Supper leading, uh, Scott, uh, focusing on being thankful. Uh, guys uh, with their arms around their wives, children on daddy's laps. We've got a lot of stuff to be thankful for in here, don't we? Uh, the Baldwin Row is filled up. Almost. You need just a little bit more. We've got two, a couple more. Anyway. Yeah, sister, sister will fit right there. You need, exactly. Um, but what a blessing. What, I hope this Thanksgiving was rich in your home. Uh, that your time around the table... Well, there was just two of you around the table having peanut butter and jelly. You don't need turkey and stuffing to be thankful and to have a day of Thanksgiving. Uh, but it's so much more blessed with a person who loves you and you love. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, lifting it all up to God. We had a wonderful time here. It was, I, I, you know, nothing we do is perfect. But our, our Thanksgiving, this, I couldn't walk away from it without saying that was perfect. That was just perfect. What a beautiful day it was here on Thanksgiving. Uh, your, your brothers and sisters are awesome, and your children are just off the charts. We had a, uh, a, a talent show uh, that was as sweet and as wonderful and as, and as nice. We, the, the entire day was just about perfect. And I hope uh, your, uh, your days have been, I hope your football teams have won, and I hope you've really had a nice weekend. Uh, what, a, what a great gathering. We are in the middle of a, an elder selection process. Uh, your elders want you to know that we aren't having a start and a stop to this process. We're, we've uh, formalized it a little bit this past couple of months, um, starting in October talking about it, in November studying it, in December uh, putting the names forward. Um, but, but if you decide halfway through December that you have somebody you want to nominate or bring forward to us, absolutely do that. It's not a thing that, that will, will end. But today we're asking uh, for you to, if you haven't already and you want to, put a name forward of some man here you would like to see uh, to be brought forward as an elder. Uh, we have talked to um, quite a few men. I think we have 12 names uh, nominated, something like that. Um, for elder, what a, talk about blessings, talk about being thankful to have that many men, and there's more, have that many men in the congregation who you could seriously look at and say, yeah, I see what you're saying, I understand that. Some of those men are not able to serve, some of those men don't feel they're ready to serve, some of those men have more growth uh, they, they want to do, uh, whatever it is, but to, that is a, an incredible uh, position to be in, and I want you to lift that up to God, to respect the men, ladies that you're sitting with, and, and that's in, sitting in front of you and behind you, and to thank God for them. Uh, we have a, a, a fantastic collection of men and women here uh, who love the Lord and are trying to walk in Him. We're going to bring uh, the names, it, after we've finished uh, talking to these men, and we're sure we have men who are willing to serve and and who meet the qualifications and who have been nominated by you. Those are the three things that come together. The quality of the man uh, in his own heart, the quality of man compared to the word, and the quality of the man in the eyes of the congregation. Those three things, him, his heart, the word, and you, need to come together in a man. Right? So it's not just one. It's got to be those three parts come together in a man. And when we think we have men who, who stand in those three ca categories... We're looking that next Sunday we could bring men forward uh, for you then to consider for a couple of weeks to talk to, pray about, and by the middle of December we hope to be able to bring and install elders here. What a blessing. This is so critical. It is so important. Let's look at Acts chapter 6 to start our lesson today. Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, the beginning, the church is dealing with a problem they have. 
they're distributing f food. <coughs> Early on, the church had a food bank. Early on, the church was feeding hungry people. Early on, the church was reaching out into its own members and making sure that nobody had any wants, that nobody was out without a daily meal. But unfortunately, the congregation was so big and so complex that there was a slice of the congregation being neglected. Some of the widows weren't getting food uh, during the day. And of course, that causes two problems. You have people not eating, and then you have people thinking you're being judgmental about people. Well, we've got to make sure this lady's fed, but oh, I don't know about her. You know, as soon as it feels judgmental, right, nerves start getting raw, people start getting irri irritable. Well, that's the problem they've got. Um, now at this time, verse 1, the disciples were increasing in number. A complaint rose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned, that's the apostles, summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this tax, task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, what Perry read for you in a few chapters later is that when they brought money to that congregation, uh, Acts chapter 11, verse uh, 29, uh, Barnabas and Saul brought the money with them and handed it to the elders. As recently as chapter 4, the very last verse of chapter 4, when they sold money locally, they handed it to the apostles. And now they're handing the money to the elders. These two groups of men, or one is replacing the other. The apostles are looking more over the entire uh, uh, teaching of, of uh, God's word around the Mediterranean, and the elders are starting to take care of that local congregation. They brought the money to the elders. The elders were asked to be busy themselves. They were taking the place of the apostles to busy themselves with the ministry of the word. The deacons, the elders would have taken the money and passed it on for the buying of food to deacons. The deacons would have handled the ministry of tables or the ministry of, of food or the ministry of, of connections. The elders were, were filling the apostles' position, devoting themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And those two things, that's a good way to think about what does an elder do, elder preachers, and what do, what do deacons do? Elders do ministry of the word, and deacons do ministry of the table. One is not uh, uh, more Christ-like than the other. One is not even more important than the other. If you get the word right, but you're not connecting with people, you're going to be teaching to nobody. And if you get serving people right, and you're not teaching them the truth, you're not going to be bringing people to anything worthwhile. A full stomach with no salvation in Christ is just a full stomach. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. He comes right in there. The, this, this answers kind of fundamentally what is it that elders are to do? This transition between Acts chapter 4 in which the, the apostles were overseeing the work in, in uh, Jerusalem and chapter 11 where the local elders are overseeing the work in Jerusalem helps us see and understand what it is in these two areas, ministry of the word, and I call it, it's not exactly written out in scripture, but the ministry of tables. We should not neglect the word of God in order to serve tables, say the apostles. And the deacon and the elders came and fulfilled their position. Let's look at Acts chapter 14. We looked at this the other day, since you're in the book of Acts. You know, if any, there are some very smart software people around here. I'd like somebody to develop a, a software uh, add-on to our electronic Bibles that does this. Because 
Now, I, when I say let's turn to Acts 14, uh, five, ten years ago, if I said let's turn to Acts 14 and I heard nothing, I'd say, all right, we need to turn to Acts 14, and then I'd hear, okay? But now I say let's turn to Acts 14 and I hear, I have no idea if anybody's, or if you are looking at your tablet, if it's, if it's to, never mind. Um, you know, don't check out the football scores, okay? Or the emails. Um, Acts 14, verse 19. Uh, let's, go, let's jump down to verse 20. While the disciples stood around him, this is Paul having been stoned and dragged out, left for dead. But while the disciples stood, stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. And after they preached the gospel in that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Now, this Antioch is Pisidia Antioch up in Turkey, not the Antioch he came from. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, and having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. This ministry of the word was so critical and so important that Derby, Iconium, Antioch, look at verse 24, they passed through Pisidia, came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word to Perga, they went down to Italia, and then they sailed back to their own Antioch. When they got to their Antioch, uh, there were elders there. So in every one of these congregations, they didn't leave the second time, the first time they came through and preached. The second time, they did not leave there until there were elders in that town. The ministry of the word was so important. The ministry of, 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 of uh, shepherding and protecting that congregation was so important that, the, that they wanted elders to be in every town. And this is the same kind of passion you see that Titus got. Uh, in the very beginning of the book of Titus, we read this over the past few weeks, but Paul says in verse 5 in Titus 1, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order, set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city, as I directed. I want to go to Acts 20 now. But there's a bit of passion in that. There's a bit of, of, of insistence in that. That in every town they came through, they left elders. T uh, Titus, you're in Crete, out there on the island of Crete, you make sure that in every city, the local church has elders. Ministry of the word and the ministry of tables. Now, in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, Paul calls for the elders of the church. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Now, it's interesting why he did that from Miletus. He didn't go to Ephesus. Uh, he sent to Ephesus. If he had gone to Ephesus, he never would have left, or not on time. He was in a hurry. And if he had gone to see the entire congregation, it would have taken him days, weeks, months to get out of that town. Everybody would have invited him over for dinner, et cetera, et cetera. He had spent three years in that city, and they loved him and wanted him back. And so he's, he decided he couldn't go up to Ephesus, so he stayed down on the coast, stayed in Miletus, and just sent to the elders. I'll just make my contact with the church there to the elders. But in this speech to the elders, we learn a great deal about what God wants elders to do. Today I want to focus on what he wants elders to do, the ministry of the word. Be on guard for yourselves, verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among, whom the Holy, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that from my, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. 
I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who are with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them, and they began to weep aloud and embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he said spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. They wept and held each other. Those men loved each other deeply. I told you if Paul had gone up to Ephesus, he couldn't have left. He could barely leave the elders themselves down there on the, on the coastline getting into the boat. They wept and hugged him and kissed him. Oh, Paul, can't you? No, I've got to go on. But no, keep going, man. God has put you there to protect the flock. God has put you there to oversee what's going on. God has put you there to shepherd. To shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore I exhort the elders among you. This is Peter talking to the elders. As your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, chief, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Young men, you likewise be subject to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You get the three words, the three names, the three position titles. Uh, they're not titles, but they're descriptions. Elder, which means a man of experience. As soon as you say elder, somebody has, has established and proven their lives. They're showing you who they are. Overseer, one who, who looks out over everything. There's nothing that falls unimportant. If it's unimportant, you've got to oversee that too because you don't want anybody making the unimportant important. And the important's got to be overseen. So it's somebody who looks over the whole thing. And shepherd. Oh, you can't get a better description than shepherd. A shepherd leads. A shepherd guides. A shepherd protects. A shepherd fights for. A shepherd sacrifices themselves for the protection of those uh, under their care. A shepherd feeds. A shepherd nurtures. A shepherd thinks ahead to next week, next month, next year. What will they need? A shepherd heals because some hurt themselves. A shepherd keeps things united and brings together, and if, and if one runs away, <clears throat> goes out after and brings them back. <clears throat> the position of a shepherd is, is, is deeply challenging. And in that description of somebody who's proven themselves, who watches over and shepherds a group of people, then when you read what Paul tells Timothy and what Paul tells Titus about these, uh, these positions, that it's a position in which a man has proven himself in his family. He's proven himself to be a man who loves his wife. He's devoted to his wife. And she, the description I, I didn't read last week in 1 Timothy 3, his wife, the, the wives must likewise, verse 11 of 1 Timothy 3, must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. And powerfully proving to the man is that his children 
obedient and have come, chosen to come to Christ and follow Christ. A man who's proven himself in his family. The second category is a man who's proven himself in his life, in his character, that he's truthful, that he's honest, that he loves good, that he's personally disciplined, that he hasn't lost control of his life, that he's victorious in the most difficult way you can be victorious. You can put two men in a ring, in a wrestling match or a boxing match, and after a while, one of them will be victorious. That's easy. I'm not sure the guy got beat down, I guess. But that's easy. The tough wrestling match is the one against the guy in the mirror. That's the challenge. That's the tough one. And, and this man, <clears throat> as an elder in his life, has proven his character. He's been victorious versus the guy in the mirror. Knows what it is to discipline his life. Knows what it is to look himself in the eye and say, no. Stop it. Humble yourself. Go seek some help. Go change your life. You be tough on yourself. A man who has proven himself in his family, a man who's proven himself in his character, and a man who's proven himself finally and critically in the Word. Loves the Word. Knows the Word. This is ministry of the word. It's a ministry to teach people, to make sure that the most important thing around us, it, the word of God, is brought up and out and into our lives. That we're taught it, that we know it, that we follow it, that we obey it, that we don't cast it off uh, and, and uh, let some modern standards or some twists or some popular ideas take God's word and shove it to one side. Family. Character word. Word is so important that uh, uh, Paul tells, takes some time writing to Titus, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers. You got to protect the church against that stuff. You got to be able, in verse 9 of Titus 1, uh, be able to exhort in sound teaching, sound doctrine, and refute or stop. Those who contradict the word. You want men who are elders who know and love God's word. You want men who are elders who know and love God's righteousness. You not want men who are elders who know families and love people. If you love people and love God, I mean love people and love good and love his word, you've proven yourself to be men who love the Lord. And that's the man you're looking for to be an elder. So which one of those can you set aside? <clears throat> which one of those can you ignore? How about a, how about a, a, a man who's got a wonderful family life and, uh, and really, really an excellent teacher, but he's personally corrupt? He's dishonest. He's, he's uh, untruthful. He, he manipulates things at his, at his uh, workplace and steals from customers or from the company. I think our latest CIA director proved that, again, how many times we have to prove that character is vital. Personal character is vital to people who lead. It's vital in all of our lives. But good grief. Why would anybody argue that you can select leaders and set character aside as being an important issue? So you want a man of a good family and a good character but doesn't care what's taught out of the word? Oh, I don't know. Let's, let's pick, up, pick some good ideas. You can't abide with that. How about a man who's really good in his character and really good at the word but his family life is in shambles? Who's, who's impatient Grumpy, bitter, difficult to get along with. Pushes people away. Quiet, distant. No, a family man is loving and teaching and patient and caring. Looks to the long range. Unifying. He pulls people together. All three areas. A man of family. A man of character. A man of the word. 
Oh, this is so important. Why all three areas? Because if the church doesn't have men who can protect all three areas, we won't be here in 50 years. We'll be something else or we'll, be, we'll have disappeared by then. You need all three. If we don't have men who hold on to the word, then who knows what will get taught and who knows what you'll end up with. If you don't have men who know how to manage your own household, Paul says, how can they take care of God's church? He says that in 1 Timothy 3. It's, it, your families are the proving grounds. They're more than the proving grounds. They are the, the developmental grounds. They're the training grounds for men of the future. You young men, you, you be close to your family. You be close to your wife. You stay with that. God is forming you, changing you, challenging you, growing you as you try to figure out how to love a wife. You can't even figure out how she thinks. That's absolutely part of God's growth and training to you. Don't throw your hands up and walk away from that. Men who have character, who love good and hate evil. Men of the word, who love the truth and hate the lies. It's an incredible position. It's an incredible job. And it is incredibly terrifying. It's terrifying to be responsible for a congregation of souls. To be responsible in your family and in your life and in your teaching that other people are going to look at you as an example. It is a terrifying position, but God absolutely wants it, and he absolutely requires it. And he would not let those men uh, go through those areas without go stopping in every town and making sure that that local congregation had elders. So what do we do with those men? Well, let's just finish this lesson here in James, I'm sorry, in Hebrews uh, chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 ends with a couple of appreciations. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the result of their conduct and imitate their faith. That's talking about somebody who led you to Christ, somebody who led you in the, as a teacher. But in verse uh, 17, so, so James uh, 13, verse 7 could have been an elder. But James 13, verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. For this will be unprofitable to you. Oh, you can chase an unprofitable statement down for quite a while. A lot of things that unprofitable could mean there. But it is a joy to serve you guys as an elder. It is a joy to be in this position. You all are sweet. Uh, your quality. I, 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 I literally uh, fall to my knees when I think about how fine your hearts are and your faith is. And that you would look to me as an example. I don't deserve that one bit. Dave and CB look at their own lives and say, what are we doing here? How can we possibly live up to these descriptions of men? But neither one of them would cower or back down from the place that, that God has put them. Remember back in, in Acts chapter 20, it said the Holy Spirit has appointed you as elders. Let us pray these next few weeks that it is exactly that, the Holy Spirit who, who puts elders into this congregation. That if we're going to have one more or two more or however many more elders here, that it will be the Holy Spirit who chooses them and that we will respond, all of us will respond as verse 17 uh, uh, comments, that we will obey our leaders, that we will be submissive to them. It's easy to be submissive to a man who's already submissive to God. That's what you want. You want a man who's submissive to God, not a man who's pushy or arrogant or, or, or tough to get along with, but a man who's, who knows how to love a family, a man who loves the word and loves to put it out in people's lives in useful and practical ways. Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Please be in prayer for this process. It's an exciting time. It's an exciting time to see more growth in this congregation. We desperately need 
need this kind of growth. This morning, if there's any here who have not been baptized into Christ or who have any need in your life that you'd like to come forward and, and bring forth to the congregation, please come forward and let us know about it while we sing the song that Barry selected. Please stand.